Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Miguel Iterate back here on the Lights Out podcast. Chris Lott will be joining us. He's off uh, in bare knuckle land again, and I've been joined by the MMA detective and... We are in legendary territory, and uh, I know every once in a while we say that, and there's no doubt this time. There's absolutely no, no doubt this time that we are <laughs> talking about one of the premier old school uh, names in the sport. Mark Kerr has joined us for uh, the deep dive. Mark, so good to see you again. I appreciate it, guys, man. I, I appreciate you having me on, and, you know, it's just it's, – it's always good to um, – Actually, it's kind of interesting because you call me old school and you guys have been following the sport for a long, long time. So, you know, as far as your old school in a different way, you know, the reporting side of it. So, you know, you've been involved in it for a long time. So, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank, thank you, Mark. We're, we're old school nerds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were on the other side of the TV screen. So, <laughs> Mark, let's start with high school. You've got... A real interesting growing up. It said like your Wikipedia. I'm not sure how accurate it is or not, but it, it states that you grew up in Davenport, Iowa, and you shared a wrestling room with Pat Militich. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. I did. It's actually it's funny how you know I I spent um, I spent time out in Iowa. My my brother was out there uh, finishing up chiropractic school, which is in Davenport. It's um, called Palmer. And so I went and actually lived with my brother for a couple of years um, and, you know, didn't really realize. Actually, I, when I told Pat this story, he, under, he, he totally remembers it the same way I do. Uh, just like he was actually one of the one of the good guys. He's one of the cool kids. You know, Pat's a little bit older than me. And uh, the high school we went to, Bettendorf, was dominant in wrestling and football and all of that. So, I mean, I, I went to a really good school to kind of kick off my wrestling career. And, you know, that was where I really developed an appetite for wrestling uh, was in, in that room. And, uh, you know, Pat and I have talked about it before. And actually I've been to Pat's gym and, and uh, you know, had this conversation with him, which is really cool, you know, thinking about it that way. Were you ever witnessed, uh, Pat Street fought a lot. Did he have uh -huh. a reputation back then? He, you know what he did? He actually did. It was kind of interesting because like, like, is in a, in high school, everybody, you know, you don't realize like, like, um, how, how do I put it? So Pat had a reputation. He, he ended up being tough on the outside of school and in school, he actually was decent, man. He wasn't a bully. You know, he didn't, you know, because it would have been easy enough for me. I, I was a new kid to the school system my freshman year, and it would have been easy for some of the older kids to pick on, you know, me or some of the other freshmen. And Pat was just never that guy, you know. But outside of wrestling and stuff like that, he, you know, outside of school and stuff like that, he had a reputation of, like, you know, a, you know, going out drinking and brawling. Let me ask you, did Mark Hand – he had a sidekick in his MMA career, a big wrestler, 280. Named Mark Hansen, did he come on your radar back then in that early trip? Because he would have been. You know what? Um, you know what? No, I don't remember Mark. I don't remember Mark back then. You know, so it's just kind of interesting because when Pat and I talked about it, I mean, he really got he really got involved in MMA and all that stuff. Um, you know, afterward because he was a decent wrestler. He wasn't a state champ, I don't think, or anything like that. And uh, so he really developed his skills afterward. That's why it's so now you, then you transfer to Ohio, Toledo. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Uh, after my sophomore year. I mean, he, here's here's how strong the community was in Bettendorf. They had uh, they had offered my brother a job uh, after chiropractic school and they had offered him, you know, incentives to keep me in the school district. And, um, you know, it's just time for him to, you know, time for him to leave, pack up, went back to Toledo and that's when, you know, again, my wrestling kicked off. And, uh, you know, either place, you know, Bettendorf or Toledo, Ohio, good places to learn how to wrestle. So, so you moved with your brother to Toledo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, 
what made you not stay in Ohio or in, in Iowa? Um, you know, my brother had a job opportunity in, um, in Ohio. He had an opportunity to, um, uh, start his chiropractic practice there. And it, you know, it's where my, you know, father and, you know, my, my dad grew up in Ohio. My mom grew up in New York city, but my dad grew up in Ohio. So there was familiarity, there's family there and stuff like that. So, you know, it made it a little bit easier to transition. All right. So at, at Wade High School, you take state championship your senior year. Do you where do you meet Mark Coleman in with all of this? Because I know he's in oh, Columbus. Oh God, man. So so I'll I'll wind you back a little bit. So I won a state championship as a junior in high school. And um Mark, like in that in that area, you knew like all the good wrestlers, and especially closer to my weight class. Like I wrestled 175. I think Mark wrestled either 175 or 185. So you kind of knew, even though I was a little bit older, you kind of knew of the guys that were around your weight class. Um, just like I had heard of Kevin Randall, even though Kevin's younger than me, you know, in that area, it's such a small uh, wrestling community. Um, so I actually didn't meet Mark, believe it or not, until my freshman year in college uh, when Mark Coleman and I wrestled at the NCAA championships his senior year, my freshman year. And he was a number one ranked 190-pounder um, from Ohio State, and he beat me pretty badly, actually, <laughs> Uh, my freshman year, and I, he went on to win an NCAA championship his senior year, and it took me to my senior year to win an NCAA championship as well. Did you get a scholarship to Syracuse, or did you walk out? No, I got a, I got a scholarship. It, it was kind of interesting because in, in that area in Ohio, uh, the only way that you really went to, like, a Big Ten school and, you know, like Ohio State or Michigan uh, was you had to be a multiple state champion. You know, they really wanted – to recruit, and there was a lot of really good wrestlers um, that were, you know, two or three times state champs. That's who they went after. And so I just happened to run into the assistant wrestling coach at Syracuse. He saw me wrestle and was like, started recruiting me. And it just ended up being one of those coincidental meetings that ended up, you know, obviously working out. All right. So at Syracuse, you win your national championship by beating Rex Holman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and, and then Holman I wrestled. Returning national champion. No, so let's let's go back. So, so interestingly enough, um, Randy. So I beat Rex in the semis, and then semis. I wrestled Randy Couture in the finals. Randy had taken second his junior year and took second to me again his senior year. So that's the but sequence. You Holman, Holman was the returning national champion. Holman, um, oh, boy, now you're going to make me question my old man memory. Rem remember, I, I, I have, I've been hit in the head like a whole bunch of okay. times, so, so <laughs> you probably have <laughs> so your memory might so be better than my finance. You go into the semis, Beat the national champion, which you were a big underdog on. Yep. Head yep. into the finals against Kultura, of which again you're an underdog. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the whole the whole time the whole premise behind my senior year was I wasn't even I, I had never even placed at the NCAA tournament. I had never even won a single match at the NCAA tournament. I was 0 and four my senior year which was the incredible part. I had the talent to do it. I just, every year it was like, it's like stage fright. You know, it's just like when, you know, it's like when you pull up to a urinal and, you know, another guy standing next to you, you kind of, you know, you get stage fright, you know, and like you're afraid to pee. I was just couldn't pull the trigger, you know, and it turns out where it, it took me to my senior year to be able to put it all together. And I had actually, uh, you know, the field of, competitors my senior year was like Randy Couture, Rex Holman. You know, there's a guy from um, Andy Foster from uh, Oklahoma. There was uh, a, another Iowa kid that was a really good kid. So it, it was a pretty stacked field. Um, so, you know, I was th thankful. My final NCAA record is five wins and four losses. 
What happened that tournament that just allowed you to turn it up? I mean, a 12 to four win over Kotor. Oh man. Yeah. It's insane. Oh gosh, man. It was, you know what? Honestly, man, when I, I've thought about this countless hours, like literally like what is the difference between my junior year and my senior year or my sophomore year and my senior year. And it was, it was just getting, honestly, it was just getting past that first match. And it was all the, all the pressure that I felt and all of that once I got past that first match and I settled in, um, the rest of it was just wrestling. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, me occupying all of this space in my head. What it ended up doing for me, it ended up actually changing the whole paradigm of how I thought about competition. And I, I was like, if you, you know, talking about competition for me is like learning how to frame my language. So I used to say, oh, my God, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. You know, it's like nervous in my head. I would run this reel. And then I started going, you know, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. You know, I'm excited to be here. You know, I'm anticipating this. This is what I live for. And and once I learned to embrace those feelings and those emotions, it changes the whole paradigm of like, even as a professional fighter, same thing. You know, I was never, you know, like nervous. I was excited. You know, I wanted to get out there. It's like understanding like there's there's nothing else in life that allows you to have that feeling like right before you're going to go in the ring. You know, and once you're able to lean into that and embrace it, it, it changes it changes everything. It really does. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Did you feel like so, you had to learn that a, a second time? In MMA or in, in oh, any, really? you know what it it yeah you you know what part of part of the process of just being an athlete and being a competitor is you're always trying to refine your obviously your physical skills but you know at a certain point you know when you're physically almost equal with everybody you got to refine your mental emotional skills you know, your spiritual skills, you know, all, all the things that you utilize that are the unseen things. Everybody can see your in in shape athlete. They can't see what's in your head. You know, and those are the things that, that I believe the elite athletes do better than anybody else is they're able to mentally do something that nobody else can do. So what is your relationship with Coleman Stark? Um, actually, it's, it's a really funny story. Um, so after I won the NCAA championship, um, Mark Coleman is trying out for the 1992 Olympic team that goes to Barcelona. My training partner was a guy named Chris Campbell. And Chris invites me out to Oklahoma to Stillwater, to go to, to Oklahoma State to uh, to train out there. And my rooming partner happened to be Mark Coleman. So the first time I really get to meet Mark and socialize with him and train with him was in 1992 in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And that's where we kind of started forming our friendship. And, you know, you went muted very well and so so um we get done with a training session and we're back at the hotel and mark is sitting on the bed and we're watching like judge wapner or whatever on tv and we're just laying there resting up before you know in between training sessions and and mark is sitting in his bed and he's just cussing and he's just sitting like you can hear him under his breath he's like motherfucker so god damn it and he goes, son of a bitch. And, you know, after about 15, 20 minutes of him doing that, I'm like, all right, hey, I said, Cole, man, what, what's going on? What are you, you know? And he goes, ah, I hate what's on TV. I'm just too lazy to get up and get the remote. You know, and I'm like, he's cussing at the TV, yelling at it, but he's just doing it mildly. And I was just like, oh, my. That kind of set the, set the okay, you know, Coleman has his own little, you know, his own little drummer. In your wrestling, would would you say that were you a real hard worker, or do you think you may have tapped the brakes a little bit? Um, you know, at certain points in my career, I for sure, you know, could have worked harder. You know, I th- I, I don't think there's 
you know, a point where, you know, it's, it's interesting because going, you know, and I think you can ask most athletes and at certain points they would say that, you know, they could have worked harder. Like, like, you know, I thought that I could have won and continued on my career and fought longer. And yeah, for sure. I could have worked better and harder um, at points, you know, at certain points I thought that I put the effort into it that, um, that was required. Um, you know, I think sometimes I got caught in the, you know, that I'm a, you know, physically gifted, more talented athlete and, you know, that kind of let off the brakes a little bit. So, yeah, I would say that's accurate. Well, were you, were you a hard worker in wrestling or do you think you may have coasted a little bit? No, no, with wrestling, you know, I, I work hard, man. I, I, I really, you know, I really, um, I really wanted to excel at wrestling and I just, I really, um, I really was a head case, you know, for a lot of years I was a head case. And then, like I said, finally, when I was able to put it together, uh, and understand, uh, you know, what I needed to do, uh, emotionally to do something, uh, to, to be successful at wrestling. So I think it was more of a head case than it was a work ethic thing. Okay. So let, let's talk about your your entry into mixed martial arts. Um, you've gone on record stating that Richard Hamilton, who was your first manager, mm-hmm. is the guy that really got you involved. Did did you train with him a lot as well? Was he original jujitsu coach? Yeah, he wasn't a jujitsu guy. It was really so he was, and I'm not going to remember, you know, if it was Kempo, Kung Fu, Sambo. Body, you know what? He 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 had just a general knowledge of striking. You know, it wasn't anything that was specific. Um, if you're gonna apply it to um if you're gonna apply it to today's game, you know, it wouldn't be something that was specific. Like he he just he, he knew how to put together a, a a training camp um to get you ready for an event. And I think at the time that was just as valuable as knowing techniques and knowing striking and knowing all of that so you know he did he did what he felt he needed to do to get me ready uh to fight and it wasn't a huge technique it was just training and you know stuff like that so you know i'm grateful for it you know i don't think he's gotten any of the credit uh you know for bringing you know dan severin to my understanding is and dan could probably correct me if i'm wrong uh you know bring a dan Dan was the first person, I think, to meet um, Rich Hamilton, Don Fry, Mark Coleman, and myself. Did you ever know that he was in a witness protection program when he was training you? Uh, I had no clue. I had no clue. I found all that stuff out after, and there's some really particular things about him that are disturbing um, that I found out after the fact. Um you know, at the time, it probably wouldn't have stopped any of us for, from getting involved. You know, when you when you know when Richard finally got a hold of me, and you know, I got my fights uh, signed my contract. It was twenty five thousand bucks a year before I made twenty two thousand uh, seven hundred and fifty dollars as a full time as a full time coach, as a rank USA wrestler, and doing all kinds of odd then things to make money. Wow! Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's a he's one of those mysterious guys that uh, you know, and, and he, he didn't mind being on TV either. It's just really strange. Yeah, strange yeah, guy. It's, it's so all all of that at some point, I don't know where he is or what he's doing or any of that. I haven't even it, at some point that would be an interesting interview. That mm-hmm. would probably be an interesting interview. Has he ever reached out to you ever since he went away? Mm-mm. No, you know, I, I knew his wife at the time was a gal named Heather, and I know that she was a lot younger than he. Um, you know, I guarantee you, if a private detective could probably track him down, you know, probably could. <laughs> did, did, when he went to prison, wait, 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 one more time, one more we go. When he went to prison, did he ever sue you for breach of contract like he did Coleman? Um, he actually, with him and I, um, oh man, it's so, so this is, this is how my fighting career started out. So this is, this is the backstory. So I go down to Brazil, I fight, um, Frederico Lapenda was a promoter. Frederico, the next day brings us, brings me 
in the vault of the hotel where they have all the safety deposit box and he's going to pay me. He pulls my contract out. He looks at my contract and he says, okay, here's this, this, and this, and this. He's paying me in cash. And he goes, okay, there's a local tax. Um, the local tax down here is $7,000. And I just kind of look at him and I still remember the feeling of like, I'm in shock. Like my hands are so beat up. I couldn't even punch him if I wanted to, because my, my hands hurt so bad. So I take the cash and he goes, no, look right here in your contract. Purses may be subject to local taxes. And my signature's on the contract. And I'm like, uh, uh, like, I don't know what to say. So he takes the $7,000 out, hands me 18 grand. And I, I'm, I'm like, still to this day, I'm like, what? So anyways, I end up getting the money back a couple of years later because Federico lived in Los Angeles. I went and tracked him down to Los Angeles and made him take me to a bank and pay me back the money. And it was not like, hey, we're going to, you know, hey, you know, it was like, you're taking me to the bank and you're going to pay me my money back. And there was like, yes, I'm going to take you to the bank. And yes, I'm going to pay your money back. And so it took me a couple of years to, to finally go, you know, hey, I need to do something. It, 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 it was so disturbing to me years after it happened that I'm like, I got to rectify this. So I get back to the States. I have a strep infection in my right hand that requires surgery. And it requires seven days in the hospital. I get six months of IV antibiotic therapy where I have a nurse come out every once a week to change my IV. So this is my first fight. And then to top all that off, Richard Hamilton hands me an itemized bill for his services. Oh. So every, so listen, this is better. So. I get this itemized bill and it says on the itemized bill, like towel, 50 bucks, towel service, $25, supplements, 500 bucks. He has this itemized list, which itemizes like $13,000 worth of stuff for a four week, five week training camp. And basically, we come to an agreement. I go, this, I'm not going to pay you the 13 grand. What I'm going to pay you is what we originally agreed upon. I paid him. And that was it. That was the end of our relationship. Um, oh, so you got him out quick. Oh, he was out right from the get go. I'm just, I, I was like, that's it. You know, it's like I could see the writing on the wall. It's just like, it was just going to be a never ending, um, you know, chase to just, yeah, yeah. And so that, that was my first fight. And I go, okay, I did it. It's over with. I experienced it, you know, and well, on with how it. How did you get here? Let, let's, let's, let me recap. Yeah. So it's World Belly Tudo Championships. It's in Brazil. It's January 19th, 1997. It's an eight man tournament. Obviously, promoter Federico Lapenda, referee Sergio Bottarelli. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get talked into that tournament initially? Like, why does the, the, why does the WVC get first crack at you? rather than the UFC? Uh, Mark Coleman took the first slot. So Richard Hamilton was in talks with uh, the UFC. The UFC knew he had like kind of a stable of, of wrestlers that he knew of. Um, I think the way he portrayed it to them is that he had been training us, you know, like me and Mark Coleman and then eventually Kevin Randleman and so on and so forth. So Mark Coleman got the first contract that Richard had to keep talking about. So um, in 1996, in the fall of 96, uh, my mom passed away. So if my mother hadn't been sick and passed away, um, I probably would have taken that first slot um, for the UFC. It just took me a little bit longer to kind of figure things out. And um, it just ended up being actually perfect the way it worked out. So your first opponent was Paul Varlins. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's reported that you broke your hands in that fight. Um, so so here's the, it's not when you do bare knuckle fighting, and I didn't understand all of this at the time. Um, 
you pop your capsules on your knuckles. So when you when you punch something, those it's like bubble wrap. You you pop them, and so I had popped the top of my knuckles to where they hemorrhaged blood in them. So they weren't broken. I just had hemorrhaged the capsule surrounding the joint, and it fills up with blood, and it's freaking painful. And uh, that's what I did. The first thing, so so literally Richard Hamilton was just like, he was telling me, he's like, you're not going to make it to the third fight of the night if you if you continue to punch. He says, you need to figure out a different way to end the fight. And so I was like, you know, other than punching at the time, I, I didn't know anything else, you know. So, um, you know, I, you can see during the Fabio Gagel fight, I start punching with the palm of my hands because my knuckles are so in, – they're just gorged with blood. Uh, left huge. hand and right hand. Oh, gosh, man, they just hurt. You know, so, unbelievable. So let me bridge the gap here. So he All beats right. Paul Barlins in 206, knees to the head, got side mount, took control of it. You really weren't throwing monster punches, but enough to where you knew it was affecting you. Yep. Um, Sydney Gano Quaves Fritas fleeing the ring. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I cut my hand open. That's where I inoculated my right hand. Um, if you see the fight, he, he starts to slide he slides out of the ring. And when he slides out of the ring, I I catch his chin. And just for a split second, where his feet are hanging over the apron. And his upper body is in the ring, and I and I punch him like two times. And the first punch I inoculate, it, it just his his I get him right in the front teeth, and his front teeth end up one of them ends up flipping out of the out of his mouth. Um, and I I inoculated the bone on my middle finger of my right hand, um, that knuckle uh, inoculated with the strep bacteria, and. Uh, that was what started the hospitalization when I got back to the States. Holy no, cow. So your third fight. Let me ask you. Uh, go on, go. Uh, I'm sorry. No, you, you said you were punching. You really didn't know much to do anything else. But like for an observer, you know, you're allowed to headbutt. You really didn't rely heavily on headbutts the way Coleman did. But you were using like real good posture and knees and elbows. And that was a little bit different. So you you weren't quite as raw as you as you put paint yourself out to be. Oh, I yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it's it's so like part of the training camp that that was put together was a lot of that stuff. It was like not specific techniques, but we're going to show you, you know, how to knee, how to knee on the ground. You know, we have like a throwing dummy and we practice like kneeing and pulling and doing because we watch film. You know, we watch some of the early UFC stuff. You are like, wow, man, this is this is like this is like on a different planet, you know, because no one really knew what was going on. You know, I didn't I didn't know what a triangle was or a Kimura lock or Americana or, you know, any of that stuff. You know, I didn't know what a rear naked choke. I didn't. So it's one where it's like I, I, I knew how to punch. I knew how to knee. I knew, you know, the basic fundamentals, but specific techniques. No, no chance. You know, so so that's what was going on with that. All right. So with Gurgel, you're, you're looking at a four time world champion with jiu jitsu, UFC 11 veteran. And he's a black belt under Jack Ryan. Co-founder of Alliance, like that's yeah. Oh my like god! Man. You can sit here and say it's your third fight, but it's not. It's, it's your first night of fighting. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually been. I've never heard it put that way, but yeah, yeah. And it's just one where where I and this is looking back on it. I go, I I would think that if if Fabio was twenty five pounds heavier it would have been everything I could handle. I mean, everything and more, you know, it just, I think the weight disparity between, you know, me being that much bigger than he was um, really just took a toll on it. And then obviously with the head butts and stuff like that, I mean, he, he, he was blind basically towards the end of the fight. You know, he couldn't see, he couldn't see anything out of his left eye. And, you know, it just was one of those where, um, you know, I had a, you know, this kind of set the mentality um, for my fighting career afterward. Uh, the next day, um, I get a phone call from his wife who speaks a really good English. 
And uh, she says, hey, Fabio wants to have you up to the house uh, for lunch. And I honestly thought at that point, I, I was like, I'm in Brazil. I'm in Sao Paulo. I know he owns a dojo. It was hard enough for me to get out of the ring that night. That night after the fight, people lingered until Fabio got on the mic. And Fabio was like, hey, just basically just leave him alone. Don't do anything. He won fair and square. And then everybody, I found this out afterward because he just, he, he got on the mic. He's like, blah, 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 blah. and all of a sudden everyone just leaves, starts scattering. Cause I stayed in the ring for probably 30 minutes after that fight um, because it was an unsecured locker room. It was just a partition. And I was like, I, I'm not, I'm just not getting out in the crowd because I was figuring they were so riled up that they would, you know, they're going to do something. So the next day when, when his wife, says, hey, listen, come up to the house. I'm like, I'm like, uh, I, I, I was going to say no. And she's, she's just like, no, come up to the house. Uh, give the taxi driver these instructions and um, he'll take you to our house. And I'm like, oh, man. So I was so hesitant to do it because I thought, oh, shit, man, I'm going to go up there. He's going to have guys waiting for me. He's going to get his revenge because I freaking had – I dug in his cut. Like on his face, I was like digging in his cut. I just wanted him to quit, and he wouldn't. So I get up to the house, and he's cleaned up. You know, he's got cuts and abrasions on him and stuff like that, but he's cleaned up. He sits down with me, and his wife cooks this amazing lunch, and she interprets it for like an hour and we just sit and talk and it was it set the tempo and the mentality of the ring is business and when you're outside of the ring you're done with business you you just don't have to have that in animosity or you don't have to have you know anger it was a competition and i won he lost and he's being the good sport about it and it was just this incredible eye-opening thing uh, about the essence of what fighting is you know it's a competition it's a trial of your skills and, and when you're when you're done you you're done yeah. I believe that you're and Coleman John Fry Severn your push with wrestling was like no 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 jiu-jitsu isn't you know the the greatest mm -hmm. combat sport in the world wrestling is and your guys push like you can sit here and Dude, I, I mean, I was caught up in it. I'm, I'm on the wrestling side. But at the end of the day, you're looking at a whole bunch of weathered, beat-up athletes from Brazil that never, ever thought they would ever make a penny doing it. And on your side, you guys were, were, bored. You guys were both broke. You guys were, like, cut from the same cloth. Yeah. Just, you really are. Oh, incredible. I mean, it, cause you know what, for every guy that, that goes out in Brazil and wins, you know, a title for jujitsu and stuff, he's not opening a, a gym that has a thousand members. They just don't, it's the same, it's the same thing, you know, for wrestlers, we're not opening a gym that has a thousand members and everybody on the electronic fund transfer. And I live on the big house on the hill. It just doesn't, you know, it's a small margin. It's a small margin. So you're absolutely right. I mean, we it, it, it is one of those things where it's why you get the Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys rising to the top and why you get American wrestlers rising to the top because it's, it is, it's an opportunity that was just never there. The mentality. Yeah. yeah. And you can't fake it. You can't no, fake that. No, no, no. No, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, Mark, to interrupt. I, 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 I wanted to ask because I've been thinking this point. The tournament in Brazil was a very, very violent tournament, you know. And you know, you mentioned also the 30 minute fight and stuff. Then you get ripped off by the promoter. Like then you look at wrestlers from that era. There were a lot of wrestlers who did it a couple of times and then said, you know, I don't need this. Eric Smith. Oh, yeah. That, that yeah. Right on the wall after the first show. Why did you keep doing it? You know there was, and this is this is crazy. So so there was just something. It was just something that you had. It felt like for me, it felt like there was just something I had. To, to, it was like an itch 
that I just once I once I once I developed it, man, I had to scratch it. I had to um, I had to pursue it. And it's just one where it's crazy because it's just one where it's just the same difference is like, you know, if you get a guy that like, you know, why are you like running blindfold into traffic? You know, well, I just, I felt like I had, you know, it's like that type of thing where it's just this feeling that you get from it that, you know, I've lived my life so many years with, without that feeling. Once you get that taste for it, there's nothing else you can do in your life that's going to substitute for it. You know, it's a, it's just a very primitive, primitive form of competition. It, tap, you know, it taps into my reptilian brain of this primitive nature of like, you know, I'm going to put my tribe behind me and I'm going to go out and, you know, fight for you. And it, it just felt like it was that that was the itch it was scratching. Wow. So Coleman headlines UFC 14, July 27th, 1997. Corners you in your first fight. He's headlining and corners you against your first fight against Matty Hornstein. Um, coming to the UFC fighting stateside, what was the difference between Brazil and here at this point in time? You know, I I still I still you know this is the the in Brazil it it felt even though I didn't completely understand it 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 felt like there was a little bit more of a, a deeper appreciation of what was going on in the ring um, than my first time fight in the UFC. Um, you know, it's like one of those small distinctions, like as a fighter, you pick up on energy and it just felt like there was just a diff completely different vibe uh, when I was in Brazil. And it just seemed like a completely different feeling when I went and fought um, for the first time for the UFC, you know, so it just, it was a, it was a feeling uh, probably more than anything else. Um, okay. Now it, it, the event itself, obviously the UFC is coming into its own, the old owners, the original owners, I should, I should say are still there. You're listed at 225 pounds, but it's believed that you are 250. Do they even have wins? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, there's no, there's no, there's no way in, there is no, there is no way in, there is, there is no, you know, there's no anything. I mean, it was, you know, to be fair about it, I mean, there's, there was no drug testing, there was no way ins there was, you know, I mean, you could have written your physical in cram. You know, Mark is fit to fight, you know, in Crayon and handed it to him. They would have accepted it, you know. So there there was very, um, very little regulation. It's, it, you know, it's not to take anything away from I, Mississippi, I think it was Mississippi, Alabama. You know, at that point, you know, the, the original promoters had pissed off, off every, you know, boxing, you know, commission from coast to coast in the only – the only place it was sanctioned uh, was I think at that point it was like four or five states are the only ones that would allow it to go on. Um, and so they had pushed, you know, Bob Meyerwitz and Art Davies down to Mississippi and Alabama to have the events. It's the only place that could have them. Did, did you have a good relationship with Meyerwitz? Um, you know, Bob was, um, he was more standoffish. You know, I didn't get to know him. I think Art, Davies was a little bit more personable um, than Bob was. Uh, Bob just seemed like pretty stoic businessman. And, you know, Art seemed a little bit more personal, like you could, you know, get down and want to get to know the fighters a little bit better. We go. Yeah, we just, I just, uh, we just did an old school interview with uh, Jason DeLucia. Um, and DeLucia mentioned that he went to Pancras and Ken went to UFC. They kind of, made that decision. Did you and Coleman ever have a decision of how you were going to cut up the pie if you're both in UFC? I mean, you probably would have wound up one and two relatively fast in contention. Did you ever have that conversation with Mark? Um, yeah, I mean, in, <laughs> we, we trained together for, for a while. So, I mean, at one point it was me, Kevin Randleman and Mark Coleman. Um, and we were training together and we, and Mark would come out here to Phoenix where, where I am now. And we would train together. 
and it just would be these extended training camps. And um, so we theoretically would talk about it like, well, what if, you know, well, they need to offer, you know, they need to offer X amount of money and we would fight or, they, you know, it was always in theory. You know, it was never really like if we fight, you know, I have to say yes. And we basically put a number on it saying, OK, if they offer me this, you know, against you, I'm going to have to take it. And that was kind of it. It was, you know, at the time it was like, you know, it was willful thinking to think, you know, the UFC would pay a hundred grand, you know, to to watch us fight. But we kind of said, okay, if they pay us a hundred grand, we fight each other. Gotcha. Okay. Did you have a feeling that Mark may have fallen out of favor with the UFC right around this time? Um. You know, I don't know if it was out of favor. I just, I know, you know, even though it was probably, you know, I don't know if it was good for, for them or not to have Marie Smith, um, you know, fight him and beat him up. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it was falling out. I think they were just like, we need to move on, you know, and not understanding that, you know, of the value of Mark is like, you know, the value of like Tito when, when the new owners took over, you know, Tito is a marketable person. And, you know, if you got to know Mark, you know, um, you know, he was like, he, to me, he's like, you know, like the man's man, you know, I'll drink beer. I'll go run into walls with you. I'll go ice fishing with you. It's like, he's a dude's dude. All right. All right. So at this That's point, the refereeing of Big John McCarthy, when, when we had Mark Coleman on and we brought him through his like, UFC career, um, in essence, when you watch the fights one at a time, you're like, oh, okay. When you watch them all in a row and you document all of the unfavorable rulings by referee Big John McCarthy, it's as plain as day that they didn't want him there. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at like 100 infractions on one side, under 10 infractions on the other while the person with wow. under 10 infractions get hammered. Wow. I, I, you know what? I hadn't even realized that. Oh, well, here. Well, let me see. Well, so at the end of the fight, Joe Rogan says, would you fight Mark Coleman? You say, Hey, you know, if it's on the table, I mean, you were very nice on the way you answered it. I mean, especially after a fight. Yeah. Then Bob Myrowitz says, this is the future of the sport. Like, and he's talking about that of yourself. Did you feel like they were just trying to kind of um, raise the slope, get him out, put you in? You know, in general, I, there I, was that buzz after that show, because, uh, and I'll let you address it, because you were the two yeah. overs, you know, of Mark. No, no, I, Miguel, I, you know what? There, so, you know, looking back in retrospect, you know, I, I think the, the idea was to have some kind of push to get him out, to get me in. They were just starting to really switch to the single bouts. They were getting away from the tournament, you know, and that would require more, more, it would require more of one person to have the ability to be able to carry the organization um, when you're, when you're focusing on, on like a title fight, right? You know, then all the energy and efforts focused on on one person. So yeah, I mean, I think there was just a a, a feeling of that's the direction they wanted to go, um, you know, but not really realizing that you know about the you know John McCarthy and refereeing and all that stuff. So you know, I've never looked at it from that perspective. Yeah, so I, I wrote, I documented it. I wrote it like a police report. Uh, for Full Contact Fighter, Joe Gold, fcfighter.com, fantastic individual, still documenting MMA history. I know a friend of yours as well, Mark. Yeah, um, yeah. It's up on yeah, his Joel, site. Yeah, Joel was there at ground zero, man. You know, he had boots on the ground when, when you know, when Mark Coleman and I were just starting out. So that was, that was interesting, you know, interesting. Because looking back on it, it's like, you know, not many people um, understood what was going on. You know, I had a complete understanding. It's like, you know, it's a, it's amazing. And I give hats off to 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 you guys and, you know, for the people that have been around for, forever. You know, it's you're just, you know, you're not jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. So Joe Gold has got 
hundreds of hours of video footage from backstage of people grappling and rolling. He's sitting on it still. Eventually, it's going to come to light, and you know, guys like us are are going to be very, very happy with that. Um, so, Dan Bobish, you beat him in the finals of UFC 14. You spend under five total minutes, like under four minutes, actually, um, mm -hmm. winning is, is UFC that, 14. Is is that Bobish tried another run. one where you uh, you know, you, maybe you got a little extra credit for for a technique that is is kind of raw, really. <laughs> you know what I mean? But and they actually yeah, banned yeah. it later, but I know, I know, and you know what? Not even thinking about it, I just think that um, when it happened, it was so just it like is Mark Kerr dug his chin into the orbital of Dan Bobish. Go ahead. Yeah, that's so. That was one where you know I just knew it was. I knew I could hear him underneath me when I was squeezing. And, and that was why I just kept squeezing because it was just like I could feel his discomfort and I could just feel him just not wanting to be there. And so nobody told me I couldn't do it. I didn't even know if it was a thing or not. But, um, you know, it just kind of happened, you know, organically. It was like, shit, man, he doesn't like this. Well, I'm going to do it some more, you know. And so, you know, it ended up being, uh, you know, kind of historical, I guess, in some perspective. Yeah, the, it, only, it, go ahead. the only um, chin to the eye socket orbital submission in UFC history. Pioneer. A true pioneer. <laughs> right. right. Well, so, you Marty Horst Jr. Like first. The Schultz brothers that used to get, like, rules changed in wrestling is kind of like an honor to them. So, they changed his rule in your honor. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So, Matty Hornstein, if you ever look at karma and what it is and how it rains down on you, look at Matty Hornstein's record. Look at his first five opponents. I don't know what that dude did mm. in this life, but it must have been <laughs> awful to somebody because it was like you, Coleman, uh, Dirty Bob Schreiber, where he was fouled at least 14 times before. Um, the, yeah. Yeah, he, the fight was stopped, and then they raised the other guy's hand. Yeah. 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 That's just, yeah. He, so, you know what? And I've actually, I've had an opportunity to talk to him years later and he's the nicest guy in the world. It's in Florida. Florida. So yeah, so some, somewhere along the way, you know, I don't know. He, he must be a reincarnation and, and you're paying somebody else's pennies. <laughs> yeah. We did, we did a clip interview with Marty. We're going to put that in the bio. If you're watching this on YouTube. Um, on top of that, after that, you go on to October 17th, 1997. Now, Mark, you're a UFC 15. You're a very cerebral guy. I have to think that you try to find out about your opponents before you get in there with them, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when you found out that the Ranger International Performance RIP hand-to-hand -hand Ranger Stott yeah, is your next opponent. How how like scared were you? Oh gosh, you know, I mean, thank thankfully I didn't get a chance um, to really think that much about it. You know, you know what's funny? So so it, this this will help out a little bit. So at, after that event was over, um, I when I got back home, uh, I had a lot of friends watch the event you know hey i'm fighting in it you know they they get the event and i probably had 25 voicemails from friends of mine that were in the military just saying hey that's no branch of the military as far as we know we have no clue what bear pit fighting is we have no idea where this comes from we just yeah. want to invalidate the majority of what so i mean it was just one of those things where you know, interesting. And, you know, I, it's like one of those things at the beginning of the sport, everyone thought it was a gimmick, you know, that they had to come up with some kind of gimmick, you know, to get in it. Um, obviously it doesn't work. So, so Ranger stat, RIP fighting systems, 30, you know, an army bear pit fighting. No one knows what that is. He's listed it. He's five foot seven, 222 pounds. You landed a knee, and like, Mark, you could tell what type of individual you are. 
because you land one single knee 15 seconds long and you look at the referee like you don't even think to go down and touch the guy no time. no he I, you 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 could see like uh and you, you you've watched enough film so you know when you get knocked out that you're either going to go limp completely limp or you get really stiff you know and when he rolls back he's stiff and i could i could feel that whole thing and it was like one of those things where i was just like i i'm not going to touch him I'm just not going to, I'm not going to touch him. I'm just going to move on. And, you know, you thankfully. You could him around if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like right on the top, man. Just like a turtle. Just like <laughs> a turtle, man. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it just, it, it, you know, it part, part of the crazy part it, about MMA fighting um, is he got in the ring. So, I mean, at least I have to give him credit. I can't totally sure. be disparaging towards him. He got in the ring. It's yeah. more than most people can. can. So, I give him that. Um, everything else is just invalidated, but I give him that. He got in the ring. He took his licking, and, you know, the rest is history. That's fantastic. You know, 100% correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, just a little for the trivia nerds out there, the Just Bleed guy makes an appearance right after the announced Ranger stat. Um, <laughs> yeah. Another legendary moment. Another legendary um, moment for sure. So Kate Benito and Carlos Bajeto meet up, and it's supposed to be a four-man tournament. Benito beats Bajeto, which is an upset, and ben yeah. and cannot continue. When do you find out that he can't advance? Oh gosh, man, that was, you know, I, it was probably, oh gosh, man, you know, that, I'm trying to think if, um, so I think Randy, so Randy had fought, uh, I'm trying to think sequence of events here. You got to look so, up the card. Yeah, it's probably it's probably it's probably like shortly after that, like right. It was within a short period of time. It wasn't like a bunch of time it transpired. And they said, "Hey, there's this guy. I think it was Dwayne, you know, something." So, and it was just like this. Hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna substitute. And I was looking forward to fighting either one. I prepared my whole training camp to fight either one. Um, so. It was actually one of those where I was like, all right, you know, next man up. Yeah, so your ne next guy up is uh, Dwayne Casson. Um, he's been training five months with extension fighting. I'm not sure what that means. Um, in his pre-fight interview, he says, I come from a long lineage of famous people. I couldn't find who they may have been or what sport they did. He <laughs> says, but this is me cutting my own teeth. And... You know, I, I was there at that one. I could fill in a little bit. I actually, I please. was actually a little bit sore. I'm enough of a nerd. I was a little bit sore at Mark because Dwayne might be the best guy you fought in the UFC, to be honest. He was a good athlete. He was 220, and he was a football player, too. So, okay. like, so he had a little bit of pedigree, but he was not in, a, in terms of athleticism. But he was, he was just too small for you, and then he never fought again. I wanted to say, I was the kind of guy who was like, hey, Dwayne Case, I want to see him again. Never happened. <laughs> it never happened, man. Wow. Wow. Wayne living in Las Vegas right now. I'm not sure what he's doing, but it looks like he's partying every single night from his Instagram. Um, when do you decide to leave the UFC? Uh, you know, this is – so after I finished with UFC 15 – um. Well, let me rewind. So I signed a three tournament fight deal with the UFC. So I'm I'm contracted to fight three four man tournaments uh, for the UFC. After the second one, um, they ended up approaching me, and the UFC ended up approaching me and saying, "Hey, we're thinking of doing this show in Japan. Um, we want." you to do an individual fight um right about the same time i'm i'm approached by um a god name a guy named uh rob i think it's robert de persia he's an robert attorney de persia is yeah allegedly the set coleman's second manager 
So he was just an attorney out of New Jersey. Okay. And so the Persia ends up saying, hey, um, I've been contacted by this Japanese organization uh, called Pride. Uh, they would like to fly you over to Japan. Here's what they're offering. Um, and I'm like, okay, what are they offering? They said, well, they're willing to put together a fight card with you and Hoist Gracie as the headliner. Um, they're willing to pay you. At the time, it was like $185,000 cash. It was, you know, to fly me over to Japan, to, you know, fly me first class to do all. I mean, it was a huge yes. list of stuff. And I'm like, you know, a lot of a lot of what was going on at that time is there was a lot of guys trying to start a promotion, trying to get something going, and they would give you this laundry list of stuff and never and they never fulfill any of it. So I go, okay, Robert, if if they're willing to, you know, have me first class, have them send me a ticket and fly me over there. He goes, Okay, done. So sure enough, man, I get get the ticket, get all that. Go fly, fly first class JL Airlines, which is, you know, a great way to fly over there, fly over there. They put me up in a hotel. I mean, it was like a week of whatever you want, we'll give you. And, you know, it was like literally they're like they flew hoisted and had the press conference, everything. And we were signed to fight and I get back to the States. Um, it was probably within two weeks after I got back to the States, I hear a knock, knock on my front door and I open the door and the guy goes, are you Mark Kerr? And I go, yeah. And they go, you've been served. And I'm like, huh? And most people don't know this story. So I open it up and pull it out. It's a summons to appear in all the UFC contracts back then, the court of jurisdiction was New York City. And so uh, the UFC was suing me in court in New York City for breach of contract. And um, it was just this, it was actually really, it was a difficult time because, the, you know, $25,000 from, from a fight doesn't, you know, doesn't go very far after the fight because you've spent most of that money through your training camp. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I get this, get this lawsuit and it says you have to appear, not like you can, you have to appear in New York city um, for X amount, for X court date. And I'm like, I don't even know where to start. Like we're, where would I get an attorney who would represent me? Uh, it's a civil and, and, suit. And the caveat is Bob Myrowitz, the owner of the UFC, his brother is one of the most powerful attorneys in all of New York. Oh, it was, it was, I'm just telling you, I, I didn't know that. It was a, it was a absolute nightmare. And so um, it turns out where, this is how it read in the con in in the in the lawsuit. It said my skills are so unique that the UFC cannot put a value on the damage that I would do to them because my skill set is so unique that there's only a select amount of people that possess this type of skill. And if I continue on the path I'm continuing and breach a contract, that I will do them an untold amount of damage. To the company and so basically what they were trying to do is is the japanese at the time what was said to me from robert de persia was if you go over with the ufc and you fight in the ufc event which was in december of that year 1998 i believe um or 97 it still would have been 97 i got 98 98. Okay. So, so this may so, have taken place in 97, but you're fine. 97. Yes, you're, you're right. And so they said, if you go over and do this, um, it will cause irreparable damage. Da, 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 da. So, so basically they said, if you go over with the UFC, forget about coming over here and fighting for pride. Pride had to be the company that introduced me, that brought me to the Japanese people, 
you know, all of that, because if it was a UFC, I'd always be associated with the UFC. So this is what was told to me at the time. And I'm like, okay. So it just happens that a guy that was my team captain at Syracuse University, um, a guy named Frank Ryan, um, his brother is Tom Ryan, who's the head coach at Ohio State. Uh, Frank Ryan is an attorney in New York City. I get a hold of Frank. Frank takes a look at the lawsuit. He says, I can handle it. Here's what I need. And like, the, like, like, like it's funny because in New York City, um, how much an attorney is going to cost is based on where they're located in, in Manhattan and how high they are up in the building they're located. Mm-hmm. So this law firm is located like on the avenues of America on the 47th, 48th, and 49th floors. You know, it's like, it was so ridiculous. But anyways, he ends up saying, listen, here's what I'll do. I'll take the case. Here's what I need from you. If I can have my paralegal do it, my paralegal's like, you know, 200 bucks an hour. I'm 500 bucks an hour. My boss is like two grand an hour. And it was just like, oh my God, it was like, Okay, you know, and it just started down this, this, it ended up being so through all that whole entire thing, the UFC knows, knows the position they have me in. What they end up doing is just totally bullying me all the way through to the end process. So uh, three times, three times I get, I get a court order stating that I, have to appear for a deposition within the next 48 hours. So it was horrible. So, so you imagine flying from Phoenix to New York city and the third deposition, I was asked two questions. That was it. Two questions. And it was, it was just, so anyways, I ended up settling. um, Literally they wanted to confiscate my passport. Um, so I didn't have my passport. It was like so, so, it was just being a bully, you know, and it was, it was again. What did it, was, it cost you total? Um, $155,000 in legal fees. No 155000 Did you have yeah. help with that? I did. I did. Was it the Persia or was it Japan? No, no, it was the Japanese. It was, it was when I went over. When I went over to Japan, um, the original owner of Pride, um, a guy named Mr. Ishishaka, his name's Kim Duck Su, um, he took a liking to me. And what I had said to them, I said, here's this lawsuit. If I lose this lawsuit, I'll never be able to fight for you guys. I need you to indemnify me against any harm. And he goes, okay, what do you need? And that was the original uh, retainer that I had to give to 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 the law firm, which was like the original retainer was like twenty five thousand dollars, and then they they got up over a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees, and they said, okay, this is it, this is our last check we're gonna write. You need to resolve this, and you know what it ended up costing me them. They just the UFC said, okay, they couldn't bully me, they couldn't knock me off of this, so I ended up having to buy out my last event on the contract which cost twenty five thousand dollars gotcha. wow yes you did you to, to all this now you've been to brazil brazil like a lot of the people used to go down and it, it's a party you know there were mm-hmm. drugs available and, and you've been very frank about that and steroids and stuff and now you get flown to japan as a guest and they make anything available to you are you are you starting to slip here i mean just um, yeah, you know, I, I think at the end, you know, I can see, you know, I can look back, obviously, in retrospect, and I go, oh, man, I wish I would have done this different, this different, this different. You know, and I think I think as a as a fighter, there's a certain lifestyle that that you think you have to have that goes with it. Um, and I think I was starting to buy into it at that point, you know, just because of, you know, it's like rock star treatment. You know, you go over there and they go, hey, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, what can I do? You know, and they're like, well, you can do whatever you want to do. And I'm like, well, you know, like, 
what is that? You know, so it just, it turns into this, I think, mentality where, yeah, you, 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 you know, I end up buying into it, at, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did, did, was your relationship with the UFC over at that point, or were you guys able to communicate? Um, you know what? It was, it was completely, it was over with the old owners. With, with Bob Meyerowitz and Art Davies. When the Fertitta brothers bought it, um, I had an interesting thing. Um, so when the Fertitta brothers bought it, I'm living in Los Angeles at the time, and I hear that they're having a training camp in Big Bear. And it's Tito's training camp, and the Fertitta brothers are up there. So I get in my car, I get the guy that was representing me at the time and a guy that was an attorney at the time, my attorney at the time, and we get in my car and we start to drive up to Big Bear. Um, it was like February of whatever year it was. And um, I'm driving up there and I'm about halfway up Big Bear. It's snowing out and um, I get hit by a drunk driver. I get hit by a drunk driver. He hits me on the side of the car. He disables the vehicle. Um, the tow truck driver ends up uh, taking me the rest of the way up uh, to Big Bear. I meet the Fertitas that night, um, explain what happened to them. They say, hey, by the way, um, tomorrow we're heading back down. Do you, do you just want to catch a ride with us? So I, so I have like this, you know, three and a half hour drive from Big Bear all the way to the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, the next day riding with the new owners of the UFC. So I get a chance to just kind of talk to them, get to know them a little bit, and, you know, get they ask me a bunch of questions. And so we get down, and uh, I'm going to say probably, oh, let's see, right after that day, they have, they're going to have their first event. They want me at the event. I fly, they fly me first class out to the event in New Jersey. Um, they put me up at a great hotel, all of that, you know, awesome experience. You know, I'm, I can see the direction the UFC is going. Um, I'm still under contract with, with pride. Um, their booking agent, Joe, um, ends up saying, Hey, we want you to fight in the UFC against Pete Williams. And um, I turn them down, and they never ask again. Oh, that's a shame. They're, they're, at the time, they were like, you get one opportunity, and that's it. Uh, yeah. Was it money, or was it the opponent? Uh, money. Money. I was, I, was making, I was making, at the time, I was making, you know, over six figures, you know, fighting for, you know, pride. And they wanted me to fight. Uh, Pete Williams, I think it was like fifteen thousand to show and like ten thousand to win. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah. So yeah. you and Hoist Gracie, how does that? How come that fight falls apart? So, so what happens is this lawsuit. So this lawsuit happens, and it has enough of a delay where Hoist gets hurt. Hoist gets hurt. Um, was that and, supposed to be for the first Pride? Uh, for Pride 3. It would have been for Pride 3. The first Pride had uh, Takata and Hickson in the finals. Um, maybe Pride 2. Is it was Pride 2 because you were the main event of Pride 2. So, so it would have been Pride, it would have been Pride been 2. It would, it would have been Pride 2. It would have been Pride 2. So, so Pride won. So he 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 had an injury. That's my understanding of it. Okay. Hmm. And and it's again, it's why I believe Hoyce ends up fighting in the Grand Prix was because he had he had taken he had been under contract and taken payment. Um, that that was my understanding. So there would be no reason for Hoyce to get in the Grand Prix otherwise. You mentioned Hickson's name. Was he ever brought up in contention in regards to a fight with that of yourself? Um, he was floated around, but all of us kind of knew that there's there's no way. 
there was just too, too I, I, you know, I looked at it like there was just too much for the, the Gracies to lose than it would be for them to gain. You know, there'd be more for them to lose if I got out and beat the crap out of Hickson, you know. Oh. And so it, it just one where at the time I just felt like there was just no way it would ha- would happen. I got offered to fight Mike Tyson oh, from yeah. Pride. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So Pride you. Pride was thinking outside the box and they're like, OK, I mean, who do you want to fight next? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, and they're like, well, we've been in converse, you know, talks with Tyson, you know, to try to get Mike Tyson over to fight. And I actually had the opportunity to talk to Mike after the fact. And Mike literally said, no, it's not what I do. Yeah. Like he, he knew that like MMA fighting and boxing, completely different animals. All right. So yeah, but, back, I mean, back to Hickson. Mike, Mike, Go ahead, Mike. hold on. Uh, I'm sorry, but yeah. like at some point here, you you went from UFC where you were still like in the Coleman circle with Richard Hamilton and that sort of stuff, and now you move over to Pride. At some point, you transitioned to more of the California scene where you were seeing more with Ruas and Boss. Can you describe yeah. that transition to us? How'd that work out for you? So, so uh, part of what I knew, um, just like we were talking about earlier, like. You know, Hamilton really didn't – he didn't he, he didn't know any techniques, you know. And I realized that after after my two years – after the Valley – you know, Valley Tudo, my two UFC fights, I go, you know, realistically, man, I do not know how to fight. You know, I don't know – I don't know what's out there. And so um, I ended up getting contacted by the guy that owned Beverly Hills Jiu-Jitsu Club um, – it was a guy named Avi Rubin, an Israeli guy. Avi said, hey, why don't you come out here and train? I have this guy, Boss, out here and a couple other guys. And I didn't know anything about Boss. The internet wasn't the internet, so I couldn't, like, look it up, you know. So, you know, I go out there and, you know, I realized really, really, really quickly, like, between Boss, Pedro Izzo, uh, Marco who was and Oleg was coming in and out um, that between them, they had like, you know, 50, 60 years of, of fighting experience, Wow, you know, that I, I, that I just didn't have. And so I said, okay, I told Avi, I said, listen, I'll come out. I'll come out every weekend. So he would fly me out every weekend. And I got to spend time around boss. He was still training pretty heavy back then. Um, and I got time to spend around Marco and Pedro. So it really kind of gave me, gave me a little window into like, really like what I needed to be able to do. I mean, boss just had a mad set of skills, you know, from ground skills and striking skills and all that. And I was like, holy crap, man, this is like, this is like a gold mine for me. Wow. And that's where I really started to develop, you know, better understanding of what, what it what it was to be a fighter yeah. but boss wow. is, like you you obviously you know you you get called a specimen you're obviously an elite athlete all the way boss you know he's a little slimmer and stuff like that, but he's as elite as they get man i mean he's oh, so precise man. like Un- give us a unbelievable Oh gosh, man there's well most of them are party stories so you know he you know as far as a a person or a coach, um, I couldn't have asked for a better for a better person as far as like just he he understood, you know, he understood what like for me individually, he really understood what I needed to be able to um to train hard. You know, he could be intense and like he just had an intensity level that was unbelievable. And then he could dial it down where he could just sit down and talk to you and relate to you. You know, it just, you know, the incredible part is I, I, I tell this story all the time. I go, my first time ever over to Japan, a uh, boss was cornering me. And um, I end up telling my, both my brothers came over to, came over to the fights with me. I, and I told my oldest brother, I said, Hey, listen, um, if you go out drinking with boss, I said, listen, you know, if he drinks, 
he's off by probably about a centimeter. You know, he's off like that much. But that much could hurt you. I said, you just, you know, if you're just horsing around with him like you do with me, be careful because he's literally off that much. And sure enough, man, I'm I'm down eating breakfast the next day, and my brother comes walking in the in the in the restaurant, and he's got these three scratch marks across his face where you know, from pancreation boss had open handed and just missed him and scratched him right across the face the night before. And it's, I'm looking at him going like, you, you just, he's just off by that much. I mean, that much, honestly, it either knocks you out or, you know, it, you end up good, but you know, he just had, you know, incredible control, you know, incredible control. Yeah. He one of the, one of the best fighters. Hickson at this time publicly stated that he would never fight Mark Coleman because Mark was just too weak. He wasn't strong enough. How did that sit? Because you're you're a proud wrestler. So you yeah. sit here, I mean, you're sitting here talking and saying, hey, you know, we knew they had too much to lose. It wasn't going to happen. What gave you that impression? But he also had the liberty to speak like that. You know, I, I just think at the time, you know, I, 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 you know, I think the Graces were just operating in a completely different, they were almost operating in a vacuum, you know, because it, it just, you know, for Hickson, you know, I think he said he was like 400 and O or, you know, 300 and O or 200 or whatever. And, and it would be like me, you know, counting the guys I beat up in a kindergarten going all the way forward to say my fight record is, you know, 107 wins and no losses. You know, it's like, well, how many third graders did you beat up? You know, how many kindergarten, you know? So I think they were operating in a, you know, a different, a different, you know, it's almost like a vacuum now because, of, you know, social media and all of that. I mean, you can't make proclamations like that. You know, back then you could basically say what you want and, you know, it stayed in its little, you know, vacuum of people, you know, now it, it resonates a little bit wider than that. Did you think that when they first threw Hoist's name at you, that that fight would actually take place or in the back of your head, did you know that it wasn't? Oh, no, no, no. I, I literally thought it was going to go down. And I was literally, I was, so at the time, and there's, so, so there's so many questions and, Ho and I've actually become friends with Hoyce. Um, him and I have had some great conversations. I, I mean, just an incredible, uh, incredible human being. Oh my God, man. I, I've, I've, I've learned to respect him in a completely different way, just as a human being, besides as a fight, besides as a fighter. You know, um, this is such a when huge I, size difference, though. Like, he's oh, one God, side. man, you know, it just. Yeah, I mean, there, there's that. And it's like he he is just such a diehard competitor knowing him like that. I mean, it would have required me to, like, break something off. You know, I mean, it literally would have because it's just he had, he had what's a rarity. Um, as a competitor, as a fighter, that he just has a will and a constitution to do whatever it takes to win. Um, and not everybody possesses that, you know, and it's just one of those things where it's like, I would have probably had to break, literally break something off for him for the referee to go, Hey, Hey, we got to stop it. You know, we got to stop the fight. Yeah. I mean, he's 170, 178 at the most. You're 250, 270. You yeah. Know? It's and just, you know what? Too much it, weight. Yeah, it just it it, it it would have been, and it wasn't like it was, you know, unconditioned. You know, I mean, at a point, you know, I I literally would define my cardiovascular conditioning. I can do whatever I want for however I or how for however long I want. You know, so it's like if I wanted to spar for an hour, I can spar for an hour. You know, if I want to wrestle for an hour, I can wrestle for an hour. Wow, wow, Bracco Sikatich. Pride 2 main event, March 15th, 1998. It's the first time we've ever seen you angry in a fight. Like yeah. fight with emotion. Yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> I was pissed and I didn't even know what they were saying. So they didn't understand that boss was in my corner. Boss beats Dutch. And 
Bronco apparently speaks Dutch and his corner man was uh, speaking Dutch to him. And his corner man was just saying, follow him, follow him, follow him, follow him. Yeah, that's it. Keep following, keep following. So I guess the game plan from the beginning was for him to follow me and get, get, get disqualified. Therefore, for whatever reason, he can keep his purse intact, you know? So it's just one of those things where it's like, I, I was, I was pissed. Because I'm like, dude, if you sign the same contract I signed to fight, you show up to fight. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You know? And then when I found out afterward from boss that, hey, he's just yelling, following, following, I was pissed. I was even more pissed afterward. So to kind of set the table properly, um, Mark goes in for single or double legs. Franco grabs onto the rope with one hand and then targets the back of Mark's neck yeah. with downward uh, elbows. Yeah. And it was, it was like, it was, you know, tens and tens and tens. It was just over and over and over and over again. And then a warning and then again. And then I just, I literally wanted to just beat the fuck out of the guy. Cause it just one where it's like, dude, it's just like, yeah, it was, it was, it was frustrating. It was it's actually lucky. It's actually lucky you were born like with your neck and maybe you know not yeah. mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Sigatich, he's Serbian, I believe, one of yeah. kickboxing's greatest ever. Trained over in Holland, which is why he speaks dual language with Dutch uh, Dutch corners. I there thought you go. Boss was the color commentator. Are you sure he was in your corner? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I know we jumped in. Okay. So, 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 no. So, I'm going to take this back. So, he could have been a color commentator. What Boss had said to me afterward. So, okay. what I'm, what I was commenting on is, is the conversation I had after the fight with Boss. So, I don't specifically remember if he was in my corner because cool. I think he was color commentating at the time. Well, he jumped in. He jumped into the ring afterward to straighten everything yeah. out. So he oh, was. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. he was. Yeah, he was, and you know what, man? He just again, it's just one word. You know, boss gets it, man. He gets it, you know. So, I was thankful to have him. Cool. What was the brass on the pride side after that fight? Was it was kind of a, I mean, it's a big event, kind of a letdown. Obviously, not your fault. Was there any conversations between that of yourself and Saka Kibara? Um, you know what? There, there wasn't. You know, they, they just actually, they apologize. They were apologizing to me. Um, okay. And, I, it, you know, part of that was kind of like, hey, this is not what it's about. Um, we're, we apologize, you know, for the actions of, of, you know, Bronco and stuff. So there wasn't any kind of kickback towards me. Hmm. Pride 3, Pedro Octavio, the Pedro, June 24th, 1988 or 1998. He's 14 and three and he's a Luda Libre guy. Was there any mm -hmm. conflict with Huas in regards to backgrounds? Was Huas mad about this opponent? Uh, no. Mm -mm. Okay. You know, Mark, Marco at the time, um, you know, he, he under, he under, and again, Mark, Mark, because of Marco's background, you know, he under, he understood that, you know, you're going to fight people that, you know, it's just inevitable. You know, eventually you're going to fight somebody that you know know well, um, or somebody that was eventually a training partner, or so on and so forth. So, you know, he understood that. Okay. What happened in that fight, though? I mean, like I, I, I recall it. Like he's a guy that, you know, he'll mean mug you at the at the weigh-ins and stuff like that. But he's kind of a serious fighter. I think he was scared heading into the fight, and then it ended weird. I mean, what, what's your description of it? You know what he? So I'm. So that was one of the situations that if, if the referee hadn't stopped it, I would have, I would have just broke his arm off. I, I literally would have broke his arm off. And, and, you know, a lot of what, a lot of what leading up to that training wise, the film that we had gotten was like, Hey, he's a well-conditioned guy. You know, he can go, you know, so just be prepared. And, and, you know, the mentality was, you know, to be prepared to go longer if I needed to. Um, and I was prepared to go as long as I needed to. Yeah, he uh, he's a rough customer. Like you could tell if somebody's got a knife wound and I'm not talking like a small one. You can tell yeah. there's some miles on that card, on that card. Yeah. Yeah. Category. Well, yeah. you, you would have oh, been, for sure. 
Because you watched tape, you would have you would have seen this fight with Goodridge, right? Yeah. Yeah. You got and that, he's another guy. Bad luck on his career. <laughs> oh God, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those where, you know, flip a coin a couple different ways and it might be completely different. So he screams, the referee stops it, he jumps up saying, No, no, that wasn't a tap. That wasn't a tap. Kind of a lackluster ending again. What are those conversations like with the Pride Brass? Do they even care? No, at, at that point, they, they just there there's enough people in the stands where, you know, I think the you know the the money always speaks louder than probably the fighter, you know. So it's just one where they didn't care. They, they I think they realized at that point they weren't gonna have um the only person that was coming back uh, was me, you know, so. <laughs> Smart. That's good. Yeah. Hugo Duarte is your next opponent, complains a lot, stalls a lot. You knock him out with 232. You kind of find your rhythm again. Yeah. You know, part part of what Boss got, Boss was in my corner, that, that, that yeah. fight. And he was pissed at me. Um, you know, a lot. Of, so this is, again, what we're, you know, like, I started reading, like, the internet started to become like a thing, you know, and I started to, tra you know, there was like blogs and, you know, stuff and you could do like, you know, chat rooms and stuff. So I, I'm pretty sure either, I can't remember where it was, but it was like, you know, Oops. Mark, you went mute again. Fight that's last over, you know, one minute, two minutes, three minutes. So with, boss was pissed at me because with uh, Hugo, I deal I deliberately drug that out longer than what it should be just to kind of prove that I could actually fight more than a minute. Um, and boss was just like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Cause it's just one where you just, you know, like anything else, you know, you know, you're more susceptible to, you know, obviously it's, a, it's, you know, when you're in the ring, you have a, a fighter's chance of losing just as well as you have a fighter's chance of winning. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah. you're on the Mike Tyson track. Like, you're just murking people. Yeah. Miguel, yeah. This, this is when Mark comes into your life. How do you two come together? Abu Dhabi, February 24th, 1999. Yeah. Yeah, you know, 99 was the big year where, 98 was the first year, 99 was the big year where, you know, the invites became really international. Mark was obviously one of the premier names. And uh, I, the first time I, I remember him was, Mark, I don't know if you remember, I, even though you're a heavyweight, they forced you to go to the weigh-ins, and we were sitting in that arena like three or four hours waiting for the VIPs to show up at the weigh-ins yeah. and stuff. And you were just fresh off the plane and not happy. And and, and, and that's how I met you. That's what, what yeah. I met you. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that – um... Gosh, man, that first year was interesting because because I didn't know what to expect. Um, so everybody got paid the same. That's what they figured out. Everybody flew coach over. Everybody got the same. So nobody could talk to somebody else and say, oh, you flew first class and I didn't. So all the tickets were coach. You fly from the States, Arizona, all the way over to Abu Dhabi. Uh, in coach, you get a little bit more cranky. Um, so, you know, I didn't know what to expect and I didn't understand the, um, importance of this. I didn't, at the time, obviously you can't, you can't look 20 years down the road, but, you know, I didn't really grasp the importance of it until, you know, I realized that the King's second born son, you know, ends up having me up to the hotel room after the weigh-ins that night. And um, Guy ne Guy Nevins, mm -hmm. uh, Guy ends up saying, hey, um, I need you. And so I go up and he sits down one-on-one -on -one with me. And he just starts asking me, how was your trip? You know, did you get over? Do you need anything? You know, anything? And I was like, well, you know, they did lose a bag. And he just looks at me and goes, I'll have a driver over tomorrow morning. He'll be there. He'll take you out to replace anything that might have been in the back. And I was like, oh, okay. 
That's kind. Of, I mean, it's just kind of weird. I don't. I don't know this guy. Well, you know, I'm not was, realizing it's yeah. part of the ro- part of the royal family. You know, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't grasp any of this. Like, I'm not getting it. I. I just. It goes sh- straight over my head, right? Mm-hmm. So sure enough, man. The next next morning, man. There's some dude t- there to take me out to buy clothes. I'm like, oh, I'm like, like ah, like really, and so. I'm I'm in, I'm embarrassed, you know. I'm like some dude that I don't know taking out buying clothes. So I like buy a sweatshirt, you know. And I go and I compete. And the first year there, which is really interesting, um, I went over and I wasn't feeling good. I had something called fill- folliculitis, which is the hair follicles in my body. My immune system had a reaction to them, and so my immune system started attacking the hair follicles and it caused me to lose a bunch of weight. If you remember over there, I wasn't too heavy. I was probably like 220 pounds, you know, instead of my 240, 245, I was pretty lean. Um, And I told the prince that the night before I said, I haven't been feeling well. I don't know how long I'm going to compete. So that's when they paired me against uh, Carlos Mejato. They paired me against Carlos Banto first first match. I win that match. I t- they, he pulls me back upstairs when I get back to the hotel. He's like, "Hey, I need you to continue competing." And I tell him I can't. I, I go. I just told you I, I would do the one bout. And he goes, "Please, if you continue on competing, I'll give you another." I think at that time it was like fifteen thousand dollars. And I'm like, uh, "Okay, you know, I'll I'll, I'll go." So I win the second match, and then I tell him I'm second done. Match, you, go, you can't, dude. It's Josh Barnett. I know, I know. Believe me, I know, man. Josh and I have had this conversation two years in a row. We, so, anyway, so it ends up being. Um, I go. I, I just, I'm not. I, I go. I can't. I just physically, I can't. And he's like, "Hey, I'll give you another fifteen thousand. So I beat Josh, and then I tell him, "I said, there's, you know, he pulls me up to the hotel room again, and he offers me another twenty five thousand dollars. And so by the time it was all said and done, none of this on paper. This is all just him saying it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I win my weight class, and I'm literally I'm exhausted at that point. And at the end of it, they pay me the winner's purse, and he pays me exactly what he's going to say down to the penny. Cool. And he sends the driver back over before I leave, and the driver says, I don't think you understand. You have to get something. And I'm like, he goes, "It's in, it'll be an insult if I go and tell him you didn't get any clothes. And so they take me to this Italian suit shop and I buy $18,000 worth of Italian suits and have them ship back to the States. I remember so, I, there were all kinds of rumors about the shopping spree for clothes and stuff. So it was, it was literally his offer. The first night, the, the whole thing started because they lost, a, they lost a bag of mine. They lost yeah. a, a, a whole entire. So I literally had just a bare minimum when I got there and he's like, Hey, we'll, we'll replace it. And then at the end of it, they're like, Hey, I just want to show my appreciation for you continuing to do the event. You know, even though you weren't feeling good here and it, it was just, it was incredible. So was that the reason you never competed in the absolute that year? That year I was just because literally I, 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 I didn't even want to go over to, but part of what guy Nevins had said to me, he goes, you, you sign this contract and it, and it, and it has a different, just, you don't, he goes, you, you don't want to do this. You don't want to not come over. You, you just don't want to do this. Um, Cause it, you, you'll never be able to do this again. You know, if you don't honor your contract and you don't come over here and compete, you, you'll not be allowed to come over again. And I kind of, and, and, and yeah, I mean, it's just one where I was like, okay, because at the time, $15,000 wasn't going to make or break, you know, wasn't going to make or break my life, you know. Um, and so that's why I didn't do the absolute. 
Now, wow. Let me ask you, since we're into the and you're clear cleared up the uh the shopping spree stuff. Now, when you went and you told them that you had the illness and stuff, is that like a conduit? Because there were also rumors that they took you to like a clinic and you know you've had problems with painkillers and stuff. Is that anywhere in the mix or are people just talking trash mm -hmm. there? Oh, they're just talking trash. I mean, so so the second year, the and I've and I've talked about this before. The second year when I get over there, um, you know, I'm more prepared. I'm like, okay, I understand what this is. You know, I understand what the what the implications are. Um, so I go over there way more prepared. I'm healthy. Um, the second year, when I get done with my weight class. Um, the next morning, so you do your three bouts on the on the night before, and then you do your finals the next day, and then you do the all the absolute. So it's a busy your second day of competition. It's it's a it's all you can handle because the your weight class finals twenty five minutes, and then you have to do your absolute, which is those time limits, and then the, then the um, the absolute finals is twenty five minutes as well. Yeah. So. So on that day, when I get up, I call Rico, who Rico Rodriguez, who I'm supposed to compete against in the finals. And I tell Rico, I'm done. I said, Rico, buddy, I can't even raise my shoulder. I can't raise my arm up. I can't get it over. I can't get my arm above my chin. Um, I, I must have tore something the day before, and I just don't know what it is. And uh, Rico goes, all right, I'll, I'll be up in your room in a minute. And so he comes up to my room and he starts working on my shoulder and he can't get it to, to, to move. And I'm like, buddy, I go, I'm going to have to withdraw. And he's like, no, 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 no. He goes, we're, we're going to find a doctor. And so we, we end up finding this, this, um, I, I'm not going to remember his name or anything like that, but we end up finding a doctor who's there for the event. And the doctor gives me a shot of Tordo which is a which is a anti-inflammatory pain management so on and so forth and within a half hour i can my raise my arm up i can you know everything so that's the only time anything came into it about a clinic or anything like that was there's a doctor on site that gave me a shot of something called tordal um and rico was doing it because rico knew the significance of me competing against him and he wanted to see me in the absolute, you know, he goes, Hey, if we, I got your shoulder good, don't embarrass me in the finals. So him and I went at it in the finals, they did the drawing for the absolute. And then that was how all that started. Okay. So your second match against Josh Barnett, he's got Matt Hume in his corner. Were you aware at that point that Matt Hume was like this evil genius that can just ruin people's tournaments and days? No, uh, -uh. I didn't have a con, you know, I didn't have a concept of the whole, um, other side of, of, cause wrestling is one of those things where it's, it's a small community, you, you know, at the top, at the top feeders, you understand who's there, yeah. you know, and every other disciplines, I had no idea of the, um, of the depth of, of uh, talent that was in these other fields of competition. You know, I just, I just didn't get it. And so, you know, looking back on it going, wow, I, you know, I'm probably better off that I didn't know, you know, obviously, because I, that would have been one of those things where, you know, it would have probably been in my head for a few minutes until I, you know, got out there and just started competing. But, you know, all the other disciplines are, you know, incredible you you know you know what I remember too when you got over there I remember, you know you're you're settling in and you're alone you don't get a corner man or anything and you you start to figure out the Abu Dhabi team is actually like Russian guys and stuff like that and they, they had Sasha Savko there and I remember I know, that's the Sasha. smile you got it's a guy that you idolize I mean, give him a couple minutes of props. Oh my God, man, he was just so Sasha. So even even more. So I met Sasha. I've been over to Russia a couple of times prior to all of this. Um, I went to a world cup in 92 and then I went back over to Russia a couple of different times where I bumped into Sasha in Russia and uh, Sasha was just incredible, man. He, he's, 
you know, one of those guys as a wrestler that you understand there's a difference. At the time, there was a huge difference between an elite, you know, Russian wrestler and everybody else. It just was a completely different upbringing. It's where they indoctrinate them, where this is, you know, this is what you're going to do. This is who you are. You know, it, it just, it, it's a, it was at the time, it was just a completely different. It's like, it's like, um, uh, who's the guy from, uh, I'm going to blank on this. Who's the UFC fighter that retired? He's 39 and 0 um, from Kazakhstan. Khabib. Yeah, Khabib. Khabib. Okay. It's like that. There's Khabib and there's a whole different class of, you know, he's just so far above everybody else and what he's able to do. And that is how Sasha was back then. He just had a whole different level. Plus, he was one of the few Russians that actually spoke English. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember you just being excited over over him. And it's like, you know, you get the spot, then he wins it, you know. So, of course, you know, the wrestlers were representing in the bigger weight classes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it, and again, I can... You know, it's just such, you know, it's like one of those things where I, I look back on it, of all the things that I did wrong, this is one of the things I did right, you know, is, you know, compete in in this to understand that this is historical. You know, this is, you know, this is, you know, Abu Dhabi, it, it'll be historical, you know, it is yeah. historical. You had a hell of a tournament. You know, you started with Carlos Bejeto, who is a savage from Brazil, uh, Carlson Gracie guy, Kim Moore, Josh Barnett, which surprised a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And you go up against a guy, uh, one of Henzo's guys, Ricardo Marias, who's also a giant yeah. human being. Oh, God, full stud, full stud. He hadn't reached his studhood yet. He was just on his way in that tournament. You know, yeah. he was he was on his way. So he's one of Henzo's dudes. In the finals, you fight Sean Alvarez, who is one of Henzo's guys from New York. Yep, yep. So, and that I mean, that is not. I mean, that is that is a lot of a lot of guys, man. That that developed an incredible, incredible career. I mean, you go from Josh to you know all the way. It's just it's, it's fortunate because a lot of what a lot of what at the beginning of Abu Dhabi you had to pay attention to more than anybody else um, is the rules. You had to, like at the beginning, because they were new, like how to score, when to score, you know, what opportunities you had to. So it was like a whole strategy that you had to come up with in your head where you had to go, okay, I can, I can put pressure here. I can do this. I can do that. If I'm able to do this late, I might be able to score and scoop a couple points or however it was. So you had to put together something because they're, because they're really, because everything was so new that you, you, at the rules meeting, it was the one thing that Sasha came over to me and said, is he said, pay attention to the rules. That was his oh, wow. only words of advice. You have to pay attention to the rules. And so we went through them. Like, like I went through them and like, like you go through them and you go, okay, here, 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 here. Cause there's not a coach in the corner, you know? And, and so it's, it's just different, you know? And so I, I went through these um, reiterations in my head of like, okay, if I can do here, I can here. And then you figured it out because you had to go out and obviously take a game plan in your head and you had to implement it in real time, which was, you know, difficult, but it, it's it's a difference in that first year, um, and it's a difference in the second year is completely understanding, you know, how to score, when to score, and uh, how to how to just keep your opponent neutralized. Now you so, mentioned you, that you uh, you went over there alone and you fought Josh, and Josh was cornered by Matt Hume. Didn't Hume actually corner you, like, for the finals? Yeah, he, 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 did, he did. So, so you know, it's like one of those things, like, 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 you know, when you're when you're over there, because it was like the wrestling hybrid or the wrestlers, and then the jiu-jitsu guys. So there wasn't really an in-between. So as you started thinning the field out, you got somebody, you got, you got somebody, 
that was from a wrestling background to say, hey, man, how can I help out? You know, or what can I do to help? You know, and it's it's always been part of the wrestling community. That's excellent. That's excellent. So you beat Sean Alvarez, and you, you're obviously in the ADCC Hall of Fame for your accomplishments there. Um, this was the beginning. Um, Miguel, why, why don't we stop there on his career, move into kind of like some open questions. Um, your mo- The movie status, it was announced that The Rock was supposed to star you star you in a feature film yeah is that moved along so so i just got an update actually this past weekend um and it's still it's still gonna be done um you know the so this is just how life goes you know so i talked to dj uh in 1919 or 1919 wow that's a long time ago 2019 so all this started in the summer of 2019. Um, I talked to DJ in the fall. So November, I think, is when the UFC was event uh, in Madison Square Garden, is I think when he made the announcement. Um, and so he was prepared to go into production later that year. Uh, so it would have been 20, uh, 2019 and 2020 at the end of that year. He was supposed to go in production, so you would have hired a director, a writer, all of that, and then he would have put it on a schedule to be shot somewhere in 2021, you know, and as it turns out, obviously the pandemic. So it's taken all the way till now, till he said when the release of Black Adam happens, that's when he's his schedule will free back up. So, you know, there there's a chance that it will get a director and it'll get a writer assigned to it uh, coming up this this next year here, and uh, it'll be shot somewhere in, next year. Right. So, you know, I'm hopeful that it'll get done. I think it'll be interesting to see um, him uh, play a dramatic role or him producing it or him, you know, the more stories that are told, uh, the more it's introduced to the public, um, the, just the better it is for the sport. There was a rumor that this is the second time that it was um, put out to possibly be a movie, yeah. but there was a rumor <laughs> that Rico Rodriguez had sued, and that was the reason it was killed the first time. Uh, that was that was part of it. That was part of it. Um, the first time it was actually um, bought by Jean Claude Van Damme's uh, production company and his people. Um, when Brad Slater, who is Dwayne Johnson's agent, um, found out who had it, it's some, it, who had my rights, uh, was a gentleman in Israel. Um, that's where he found the, the movie rights and he had to buy them out from that. So it was originally shelved, um, back, I believe in 2006, somewhere around there, 2005. Um, so yes, it is the second time it's been shelved. So Rico did sue, though. Am I correct on yes, that? Yes, he did. He did, and he received as part of his compensation. He received. I think he's he has about. I'm going to say probably thirty to forty hours of footage that was shot um, with him at around that time. The Smashing Machine was shot. Um, so any footage that had him in it, um, he received as compensation for him suing that we portrayed him in a in a bad way, I now, guess. How 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 did is that is that the end with you and Rico? Because like I mean, you guys were friends too. Like I remember you cornered him in his pride debut. Like I oh, was yeah. actually at that show. So like, So you know it's you know it's even funnier. So while we're on this Zoom call. And doing this interview, he's called me twice. He doesn't know I'm on an interview, but he's mm-hmm. he's called me twice and he's texted me. And I, and I saw cool. the call coming through. So cool. yeah, we Don't actually re- we actually reconnected a couple of years back, and it was one of those where, you know, I'm he's like a little brother to me, and and um, you know, I'm almost embarrassed that we didn't talk for as many years as we talk as we did, you know. But you know, again, it's one of those where. You know, five minutes with him, the awkwardness is over. We're talking like no time has passed, 
between us, you know, which is great. That's good. That's good to hear because he's a, he's a good guy. Tell him we're coming for our interview with him. We want him. Oh yeah, he'd love it, man. He's you know he he you know Rico's like one of those just guys. I don't think it's enough credit, you know, for for what he did and you know like he literally if you if most people don't realize this. So when he signed with the UFC, he was under contract with the Japanese. He he held the king of the cage in California heavyweight title. And he resigned from all of that. And he signed with the UFC to fight um oh God, who did he fight in New Jersey? The oh my god. So he fought on uh the first was card it, with say that again. Pedro his, though. That was no, towards the no, end. No, it was who does the vampire fangs? Uh, Andre Lowski. He fought Erlowski. He fought Orlowski in New Jersey as his first fight for nickels. He felt for nothing, for nothing. And he took that chance to where he ends up beating Randy Couture to win the heavyweight championship, which for for him and for Randy, it just is incredible. It was incredible. Yeah, it, uh, I, I was at that fight, and it was a great performance on his part because – because Randy gave uh, Randy was just too small, I think. Because Randy gave him hell yeah. for three rounds, man. Oh, Randy, he wore him out. He just wore him out, man. You know, and again, that's where size does matter. At some, to some degree, it does. Yeah. Did you hear a rumor that Mark Coleman had in his contract that he was not allowed to fight Tom Erickson? Oh man, that might be true, man. I tell you, I wouldn't want to fight Tom. Man, Tom was big, dude. I've I've trained with Tom. Like Tom, I've wrestled with him and trained with him. And Tom was just one of those big human beings. Almost didn't realize how big he was and strong he was compared to everybody else. You know, so um, Mark wouldn't dodge anybody. So I would say that would be no. But I would have probably. Tra- You're just that one out, Mark. Hey, yeah. I got I got a question on that. I know we're not touching on on the second Abu Dhabi and the absolute runs and stuff, but we'll do that next. Because you talked about Erickson and 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 you faced Barreto and Alvarez and Morai. It's all big guys. Did you have more trouble with Leo Vera than anybody else? Oh how, my how gosh, man! About that? So yeah, you know what? Honestly, the 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 reality of that is absolutely it's it is. Most people don't realize when a big guy fights a little guy like that to be in a situation where you you can't like you can't bully him and manhandle him because you look like an asshole. You know, if you just went out and freaking crunched him up in a little ball, you'd look like an ass, right? So there, 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 there's you know you do it to somebody your own size, it's big deal. He's your size, right? So so there. Yeah, actually, I I I got a, um, a I think it was like a five thousand dollar bonus for sportsmen of the tournament or whatever for not slamming him when I had him up in the air. So they had I didn't realize they had it, but I got like a sportsman award or competition. I forget what it was, but I took the money graciously, you know, and <laughs> part of part of the payout. <laughs> Now, let, let me ask you, though, there's also the rumor that, because that was an exhausting match. I mean, you're chasing a little guy around. Oh, yeah. There's also the rumor that you kind of didn't want to compete in the absolute, or you tried to, to back out after that fight. Like, hey, I'm, were we having problems there? Did you throw up? Um, what are you talking about that? You no, know, you know, I, I, you know, once once I got past the finals with Rico that, that morning, I, I said I'm all in. And, you know, part of what I ended up doing was most people don't realize how how physically demanding that is um, to do a 25 minute, you know, finals and then jump into an absolute. And then, you know, I, I literally just ate hydrated and tried to sleep. I would get up in the stands and I would lay down or go in the back and lay down. And, you know, that's that's all I did until the until the absolute was over. 
you know, because it just takes so much out of you. And, it, you know, you learn to gear it up and gear it down. So against, you know, some opponents, you, you have to put more, obviously, effort in than others. And you learn to conserve that energy. Um, but, you know, there's a point where it's like, you know, I'm like all in. Doesn't matter what what it takes. I'm gonna try to win this thing. Wow. Have you ever, have you ever been approached to go on Joe Rogan? You know um, that actually came up last year. Um, no, I'm sure I could get on, but no, I haven't been approached to. It's probably one of those things that I was waiting till I had a little bit more information on understanding what was going to go on with the movie uh, before I wanted to go on there. So I think probably coming up, uh, probably either at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year, I'll end up trying to be on it. That's smart. Smart move. You mm-hmm. also had your own team at one point, Team Kerr. You had yeah. Maurice Doom, Mo Doom, Maurice Wilson on that mm-hmm. team. Oh, oh God. Boy. Yeah. Man, there's, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, I, when I look back on it, I was probably more than happy to be on you know, Team Hammer House with Mark um, and with Kevin. Um, You know, I mean, those are fond memories, man, all of those. Yeah, yeah. Miguel, we hit about the two-hour mark, buddy. Why don't we wrap this one up? Mark, we'd love to have you back on again, maybe in a month or two, if it's not a problem. No, I'd love to, man. You guys got my number, man, Mike. I'd love to be able to, to, you know, talk with you guys. This is, you know, part part of, like – you know, like anything else, man, it's like, I'm talking about myself, you know, so it's an easy topic, but, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy just getting people, uh, you know, the little tidbits of information that, that they don't have, you know, and they look back and, you know, take a historical look at it and know that, you know, I'm honored to be part of the history of, you know, of mixed martial arts of, you know, Gila's mission grappling and, you know, all of that. So, you know, I really appreciate you guys having me on and, you know, just let me know when the next time you want me on. I'd be more than happy to do it. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you so much, All right. Sir. You got it. Thanks, guys. There's one last thing I wanted to throw in here first. Because you're doing an Abu Dhabi tour, uh, uh, seminar like in September, too. Right? Yeah, yeah, give yeah. A plug for that. You know what? It's going to be at the event in Las Vegas. There's an opportunity for – People, if they're interested in it, um, they can contact the promoter from social media. Uh, you can get on Instagram and do it. And it's going to be all the Hall of Famers are going to take about 20 minutes to 30 minutes a piece. And they're going to go around to the groups. And it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for you to get instructed by, you know, all the Hall of Famers going in. So it, it's one of those things where it's like it's, it's a fantasy for me, too. You know, there's so many guys going in that I just look at going, wow, you know, I'm part of this group. So it's an opportunity for, for, to get a little bit of technique, get a little bit of understanding how, what, who, you know, what made you do this, that, and the other, you'd be able to ask questions and all that. So I appreciate it, Miguel. Thank you uh, for the, be good, brother. let me pause. Mike Davis, we got a giant in the books. Mark Kerr is in the books and uh, feels good. good. What do you think? What are your impressions? Well, one, he's sober. I like that. Um, yeah, I'm kind of a person in that boat as well. Um, he looks healthy, looks good. He's still a ginormous human being. Uh, I thought the interview went really well. We got super nerdy. He texted me right after asking for a link. He wants to, uh, you know, review it. Really enjoyed himself. He'd like to come on again. Um, but yeah, it was good. I, I, I was I was real happy. Um, the ADCC stuff I, I, I was surprising to me. I'm really glad we got to peel that onion of the layer back. And yeah, you know, the thing is, Mark doesn't give many interviews, but the interviews he does gets lots of hits. And people have attempted our format before, but they just can't get it right like us. So I, I was glad to finally give Mark in his career the justice that it deserved. Yeah, you know, I I mean, I watched some of the other long interviews that Mark has done, and he's been open about it. And um, I know there's at least one story in there that he repeated, and that that's something that I was aiming to not get and to get a little deeper than that, because I do think that, you know, like for example, once we got to Abu Dhabi, you know, 
I was there with him. I remind him about his, his first appearance in front of everybody who was at the weigh-ins, and he walked in, he looked like he had been sleeping um, with his bag straight from the airport, you know. Um, and he starts to remember the whole time. And there's nobody who's talked to him about that stuff for real. So um, I think that that was very, very interesting. I, I'd like to continue on the Abu Dhabi stuff. He goes south, and he always does a good job of, of facing his, his negative points, too. So I'm looking forward to to the other other parts of the interview with him. Uh, you know, right. he's likable so, too. That's the other problem with him. It's like yeah. I you, you just like him right away. You know, you connect. Like on my end, like because I'm kind of navigating where where you know the plates spin and the parts move. I don't like to listen to other long form interviews because I don't want anybody accusing me of cherry picking information or saying oh he's just repeating it. If there's anything that repeats an interview, that's just by happenstance. And I don't even want to talk to anybody about the, long, the other long form interviews of any of our guests. I just like to kind of do us by us and, you know, keep it original on our side. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not too worried too much about that. There are no real people doing this type of long form interview. The fact is, is, is Curry's out there with long form interviews because he's kind of a transcendental guy. You know, not everybody's got his, their life rights, you know, ball for them from them for by the rock, you know, um, plus his other history and stuff like that. So, yeah, they cross over and tap, you know, some of the big guys who've done pro wrestling and things like that, that are MMA guys. But, you know, they're never going to have an interview that they can do with, you know, the Steve Burgers and Gerald Mearsharts and Encinitas of the world. So, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. But I thought Mark was really good, man. Um, he was happy to be here. I think we could probably get two more interviews out of him. We're still waiting on Coleman. He reached out to me and saying he just doesn't feel like talking. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to harass Mark Coleman. Like, gently, because <laughs> I don't want him showing up at my door. You know, I'm not saying dox him. I'm just saying nudge him towards that finish line, because pride is coming up in his career. And it starts, I think, with the issue that we might be running into is that first match of his. I don't think he wants to address it. Yeah. Yeah, you know. It's, it's just put this way. You look at it with hippo eyes. Uh, put it this way. I'm a, I'm a guy that you, you got to consider here. The bottom line is, is I don't think there's any entity out there that will sue him at this point for, for speaking. And I think that's no, the think real bottom line. That's pride. the real bottom line. It's like he can't, if he, if he made an agreement and really can't say anything and there's still a power out there that's going to throw a lawyer at him for talking about it, then, yeah, whatever. He, he should he should not do the interview. But I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, KRS and Pride and those entities, you know, are not active enough at this point that, that they're going to send a lawyer on him for telling the truth. Uh, yeah. you know, under the hood. So we'll see. It, you know, maybe we're just fantasizing about what the truth is. That's true. That's possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please like, share, and subscribe. We cannot do this. Look at our view count. You listen to these videos, and then you look at the view count, and you're like, there's just no way. There has to be more. It's not possible that we've got such few eyes. That's because you're not sharing it. It's you're a part of the problem. Right, Miguel? Tell him. Yeah, you got to share. And you got to, like, I mean, I'm a big, I'm big on leaving the podcast playing, like, on your grandma's phone. <laughs> like, because you won't notice, and it'll just play through. And it, it benefits us if you listen to the whole thing through, listen to the commercials, you know, all, all the little things that uh, oh. <laughs> is happening. You know what I mean? So let's talk about how this podcast came together. So Ed Tyson who we do a, uh, a mixed martial artifacts uh, little program with. Ed Tyson gave us Mark Kerr's number. He's been like, dude, between you and I, he's been sliding his numbers of people that there's no way that we should have access to those, those phone numbers. And then like what we do is we send them messages like we're like friends of like a very far removed friend and that they asked us to reach out. <laughs> so we kind of. You know, kind of cut their legs off. We try to get the interview in as fast as possible so they don't contact the other person asking about our credibility. So that is how we got Mark Kerr. 
Well, Mark Kerr is in the books. We got to get, we got to do whatever it is we got to do at this point, Miguel. <laughs> yeah. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.